Given my YouTube absence for a while, you're probably thinking I've been sitting around doing nothing all day long. Well, that's not true. You're looking at my latest project, which is a type of 3D scanner called a LiDAR. And what you're looking at here are some computer-generated graphics that I've created from the output of the LiDAR and after a visit to an old church. So how does the LiDAR work then? Well, it's completely different to a normal camera. It's sending out pulses of light and it's timing how long it takes for those pulses to come back to the scanner. Because you know the speed of light, that means you know the distance to the object that you're looking at. And then, by mechanically scanning the rangefinder around the world that surrounds it, you can produce a set of 3D points that a computer can render from any angle. But enough of all that, let's go into the workshop and I'll show you how I made it all work. You've just watched me make this, which is a bracket to hold this Garmin laser range finding module. And the plan is to take a stepper motor so that I can tilt the laser range finding module and then to use this gear so that I can spin the whole apparatus round. Now this is going to go down here. It's a, a gear that I've ran off on my 3D printer and I've put a GT2 tooth profile on it so I can use this timing belt. Second gear that I've bought goes down here and then a second stepper motor goes here which can spin this. Then I'm going to take a bearing which goes over the edge of this. Second bearing goes up here. I'm going to make a shaft that goes through the middle. On the edge of the shaft I'm going to put a thread profile so that I can use this nut to clamp everything together. I make a bracket that goes here, and that bracket will hold this assembly and the stepper motor that goes here. For the most part, the shaft that runs through the middle is going to be fairly straightforward to make. The only slight complication is that I need to put that M25 thread round one end to hold the clamping nut that will fix everything in place. Now at the back of the lathe, and you can see in this picture here, there's a whole bunch of gears, and that controls when the lathe is spinning apart here, how quickly the carriage moves the cutting tool along. So what we need to do is set this gear ratio so that the rate of movement of the carriage is correct for the thread pitch we're trying to cut. Now for my M25 nut, I think it's either 1.25 or 1.5 mil the pitch. I'm not sure, but you know, we'll find out before we start. We're gonna choose the correct gear ratio here, and then walk over to the lathe and set the gears according to the manual. With the lid back on the lathe, I can now get on and cut the thread. Now traditionally when you're cutting a thread, you run the tool from right to left, and then you need the reactions of a fighter pilot to stop the tool crashing into the part at the end of the thread. So what I've done is I've turned the tool upside down and I'm running the lathe in reverse. But there's also the problem of whilst this is spinning and I need to get electrical signals in and out, we can't have the wires getting in a tangle. So I've bought this, which is a slip ring. This can spin round and round and these stay still. 
the slip ring has its wires going through here through the bearing and so on and so on up to the circuit board and the electronics which is going to drive this. Next up it's the bearing holder and the bottom plate that that attaches to and that's really just a set of fairly trivial machining operations. The next mission is to start thinking about the electronics and the software that's going to be needed to control the system. There's going to be two sets of electronics, one of which will spin round with the rangefinder module and the other set will be mounted onto the base plate. And I'm using these prototyping boards just to try things out and to test ideas before I actually start designing the final electronics. They're going to be connected to each other by the slip ring which is carrying data, it's carrying motor control pulses and it's carrying power back up to this board. The range finding module will be connected to the top board via this cable. The data goes through here, through the microcontroller, down the slip ring into this microcontroller and then we need somewhere to store the data. So I've got an SD card and an SD card holder which is going to be connected to this microcontroller. I've got two stepper motor controllers. The first one is to control the motor that operates the pitch of the rangefinder, and the second one is to control the motor that spins the rangefinder round and round. And then finally, so that I can see what's going on, I've got an LCD display panel which is going to be connected to this microcontroller. Once it's all assembled, you can see as soon as I switch the rangefinder on, it starts reporting data to my PC, and as I move my hand, you can see the range data changing. Now the problem is all of this stuff is just far too big and bulky to actually fit on top of any of the mechanical parts. So this means I need to design my own PCBs, and to do that, I'm going to use the Eagle PCB layout software. When the design's finished, I'm going to send the design files off to PCBWay in China for manufacture, and whilst I'm waiting for that to be done, I can get on with the rest of the mechanical build. This part is the bracket that the top stepper motor is going to attach to, and then it fits onto the rotating shaft which is driven by the bottom stepper motor. There's a few different ways I can think of making this, but I think the easiest is to cast it out of aluminium. So I'm going to design the part in Fusion 360, then 3D print it, that gives me a mould, 
I'll set the mould in oil bonded sand and then I can cast it in aluminium. Unlike the copper alloys, so all your bronzes and your brasses, the pouring temperature of aluminium is actually quite cold. You're only looking for about 720 degrees, and that's really easy to overshoot, and you need to avoid that, otherwise you get all sorts of casting defects. I have to say, I've been really impressed by PCBWay. I uploaded the design files to them on Sunday, and the circuit boards arrived the following Thursday. And now that I've got them, I can assemble the components onto the board, and then finish building the LiDAR. With it all put together, I can now head out into the garden and try doing a scan. But of course that's only half the problem. I've also got to find some way of visualising the data that comes out of it. And that's where zombies come in. 
Now the chances are you're not seeing the immediate connection and that might be because you don't know about gaming engines. So according to Wikipedia, A game engine is a software development environment designed for people to build video games. Developers use them to create games for consoles, mobile devices, and personal computers. And crucially, the game engine that I'm planning on using, Unity, doesn't care if I'm killing zombies or plotting LiDAR data. What I've decided to do in Unity is just plot each point as a sphere. Now out of the LiDAR, the points are coming in spherical polar coordinates, or in other words two rotations and a distance. What I need in Unity is X, Y and Z coordinates, so there's just a little bit of maths to map between the two. And the final problem is that the church scan had over three quarters of a million data points, and that's just too much data and too many spheres for Unity to be able to render at any sort of useful frame rate. To get around that, I've divided the world into Minecraft style cubic meter blocks and then further subdivided each block limiting the maximum point density and as you can see that seems to work quite nicely. The most important thing of all of course is finally I'm in a position to answer that greatest mystery of all time just how high is the chimney pot. Eight hundred and thirty nine centimeters. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it, and if you did, please subscribe and please leave a comment.